Well, I'm going to uh, kick this off. Good morning and uh, welcome to the June um, meeting of our uh, virtual X86 virtual community. This morning we've got uh, Lerone Latouche. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes, you got it. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, he's our uh, HPC solutions architect. He's going to take us through um, our HPC offering. Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. So, good morning, everyone. So, my name is Ron Latouche. I, I am a part of an Auto America HPC solution team. Today, I'm here to discuss Lenovo and HPC and how our products are aligned to fit into any of our um, data center. All right. Um, down here. So, so the, the agenda for today includes includes Lenovo and Enterprise Space, HPC strategy where Lenovo stands, Lenovo X86 hardware, and a quick look at the Think Server SD350 and 400, which is one of our continuous 2U, 4U nodes. Um, we'll spend some time on Condo Cluster example, give an example, some examples of what a condo cluster is like and how you can build out for condo cluster when talking to clients or even in some of um, the existing data center. And we'll cover briefly um, on GSS storage. So, so as Lenovo move to focus more on the technology targeted for the data center. The area upon which Lenovo look to succeed or become a market leader lies within the newly structured um, data center group that here, here in Lenovo. So based on the direction the market is going, data center and mobile technology are forecast for more growth in the billions of dollars year after year with no hand in sight. Although the PC business is declining, Lenovo will continue to be the number one vendor. However, Lenovo has positioned itself to compete and increase revenue in all areas of the growing information technology market. So what this boils down to is that Lenovo is, is willing or is driving deeper into the 87 billion data center market growing, right? So, so what Lenovo plans to focus on is offering new solutions that drives revenue in the next generation software-defined storage, um, gaining footprint in the data center with next generation computing, networking and storage hardware, and sets the bar for others to compete in industry with standard benchmarks using the latest generation of Lenovo's high-performance servers, and also expand in the hyper-converged appliances area. Um, I'll keep going, wrong slide. Okay, here we go. So, the we have been we have been been identified as the number one leader in for instance customer satisfaction. So so with this it's based on a foundation of trust, right, which leads into a solid momentum and progress in our journey to the enterprise space as far as leadership. Uh, we achieved a twenty six percent high volume X eighty six growth. In the most recent quarterly server report from IDC, we have twice as many partners worldwide set on selling the Nova Enterprise products, and we continue to see momentum through the channel. We are number one in X86 server reliability, and recently the Nova was, was recognized by Interbrand as one of the top 100, 100 vendors. Also, not only is Lenovo Enterprise value based on heritage of innovation, but on a foundation of trust. 
Only Lenovo Data Center Partner can Lenovo continue to exceed our customers' current future expectation. This foundation, as you can see, is based on three pillars. One is leadership value, based on innovation that really matters to customers in a data center. And number two, we are open and flexible with an open ecosystem strategy providing flexible solutions that are easy to integrate. And third, we strive to be easy to do business with and serve our customers as trusted technology advisors and to tailored and responsive engagement such as building out in different data centers. Clearly, as you can see, when it comes to solving um, data center challenges, uh, our overall strategy is based on a deep 30-year heritage of innovation in solving data center challenges. And this 30 years span from the fact that we we transitioned from IBM, the same folks here in Lenovo are, are what you'll find working on these high-end type of solutions. Like our CEO, Huawei, echoed about DCG, the, 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 the treasures in the talent. And basically, that is what he acquired from IBM, not just the System X brand of hardware, but the true talent of the people to continue the innovation and take over of the data center. Right, so we have the very best engineers in the world pushing the limits of what's possible, just as we have done since 1999 when we developed the first 1U rack server or the first scalable 16 socket system in 2002 or the first integrated memory channel flash storage in 2014. As we define innovation in x86 for decades and this transition is will continue on behalf of our, of our customers. When Lenovo acquired 6MX, they acquired 20 years plus a veteran team of experienced HPC experts in a rich portfolio of HPC system and a respected brand with quality you can trust, consistently ranking number one in customer satisfaction through number one in x86 reliability and uptime. And also System X has a long proven history of proven innovations, value focus, security, reliability, reliability and, and support, right? With security, we have the most rigorous security process in the industry with end-to-end -end control over development and global supply chain. So basically, our growth aspiration in HPC will be supported by clear strategy, operational excellence, product innovation, and client commitment. And I'll touch on, on those um, later on. All right, for those of you who are familiar with the System X brand, we, Lenovo, have been involved in HPC since 2000. This involvement started when Linux became a mainstream operating system. With that, our first deployment was the Los Lobos followed by Roadrunner. In fact, some of the members of the HPC team in Lenovo were involved in the design, installation, and running of the different benchmarks, including the top 500. As processing technology changed in high-speed internet connect, High speed internet connect network became standard, so were the system manufactured by, by Lenovo. Lenovo started off with the iDataplex, one of the densest systems on the planet, followed by a much denser platform, the next scale. Now, as we are looking to make a footprint in just about every data center, the focus has been shifting to dense, optimized HPC solution in a 2U, 4 node form factor. This list are just a handful of some of the clients we have been engaged with after the transition from IBM. We're continuing to see new growth in, order, in other areas, and this is just an example of the broad HPC market segment, touching traditional HPC, roll your own, and general scale out HPC. Now, 
Um, suppliers of HVC technology often have to choose between two types of systems they deliver. They either have to become a hardware supplier only and drive hardware delivery through the channel sales and high volume delivery models with no support for any break, anything beyond break fix of the hardware. Right. Lenovo is positioned to be able to deliver what the customer wants. They only want hardware at low cost and fast. We can do that. They want a fully support hardware and software product. We can do that with our intelligent cluster and, and leading edge um, technology. With the, with the merging of the system X from IBM, Lenovo brings to the market the ability to deliver what the customer wants. Lenovo has a balanced approach to how we deliver HPC as, a, as, as one model, enterprise HPC or open systems HPC. Right? That approach allows us to choose what our customers want, not what we want. Our experience in the channel and supply chain coupled with the System X experience designing and delivery of world-class HV system allows Lenovo to be both a low-cost supplier of hardware and a developer of supported HPC solution. So based on what you're looking at on, on this pillow, you can see we're open to different um, applications. We're open to even different hardware that that are um, targeted for the HPC environment. So we no longer are restricted to, to what can be dictated um, through, 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 through IBM, right? Lenovo does its own thing. So, so our hardware is designed for rigorous demands of HPC, right? Thanks to the deep engineer expertise, we continue to design system that can stand up to high utilization and demands of, of our HPC users, right? The, the hardware that we sell, they are all optimized for, for performance, right? We have continued to, to see to be number one as far as our reliability and HPC um, hardware, and we also continue to be the number one again, right? The third thing that I think that really separates us from the competition is co cooperative innovation and our desire to collaborate openly with the industry, finding ways to closely work with our vendors and our clients in, in solving mutually interesting problems, something we, Lenovo, embrace. This new, new center and innovation that we, center that we have um, in Stuttgart demonstrate our ability to partner, to partner with, any, um, with any vendor, even include our clients. So the question now becomes, what HPC is to Lenovo, right? This means that systems optimize for performance that race against the competition, such as our next scale, right? We also build systems that are feasible and dense as they also go up against the competition, setting us as number one, as oh, number one are the differentiator between different hardware, x86 hardware, and also systems that are highly reliable and have a high availability as it as the arm of the innovation that Lenovo tries to do. So our complete line of HPC ready system, most of this um, you guys are familiar with, is built on um, built on our next scale and our one U two U rack servers and also our GSS. So with the next scale, we have a clean, simple, and lightweight design. Basically, it's it, it's it's nothing specialized with the next scale. Just processor memory, space for high adapter and hard drives. We have in our chassis, we have a shared power and cooling, meaning that. Each nodes, none of the nodes in the chassis has their own fan to cool the process or anything like that. Basically, the chassis does all the work. And then we have standard networking product. 
such as we can install any third-party networking hardware within the compute node itself. Nothing, no networking gear goes inside of the chassis. And then we have a single architecture that can either house compute nodes, storage, or accelerators, such as GPUs or even Intel, PIs, coprocessors. And then we have choices in water cool technology or just simply air cool type servers. Uh, we have our optimized x86 system that are in the form of a, of a 4, 4 u or, or 8 u type server that offers up to 12 terabyte of, um, of RAM. And then we have our blade-like flex system chassis that is used in our converged space for um, high, high, high availability and reliability, meaning that all your networking and, and storage and so on can be part of that chassis. And then we have our rack servers, general purpose 1U and 2U servers that we use in most of our um, hardware design. So already Lenovo is showing how serious they are in HPC with a number of systems on the top 500 supercomputing list. Our momentum did not end after this transition from IBM. So today, the team are working to ensure we are recognized as a leading contender in HPC. Right? This list is from November 2015 from the top 500 list, and we plan to add more to this list um, come this year. As far as research and development, Lenovo is geographically diverse, significant investment and serious about technology. So basically, we have major research labs in the U.S., in China, and in Japan. And in Stuttgart, Germany, we have our HPC Innovation Center where customers can be granted access for running their own benchmark. Right. We have proven our strength in areas such as HPC by offering choice of here and water cool technology, as in the next scale. We have proven ourselves again by innovation by partnering with companies such as the Arts Tree Center in the UK to develop the first harm based system for research using next scale. We have innovation through collaboration by working with ISVs and business partners such as Mellanax, NVIDIA, and other partners and clients to leverage HPC in the data center. And we also have a large scale out wins that ended in breakthrough installation and performance benchmarks. So we are continuing to grow in the HPC space uh, based on what, what we're seeing in the market and where the direction is going. So, our formula for success includes a clear strategy on winning and maintaining market share, to design products that are at the bleeding edge using new technology along with innovation, continue along the path of operational excellence by embracing in-house manufacturing and ensure on-time delivery of products and services to clients around the globe, and also to work with the diverse global team in all aspects of the business to ensure that our products, services, supply chain, and so on, all meet in the customer's expectation. Right? With that, I'll go into some of the dense hardware that we have and talk about our next scale products. So, so I know most of you on the phone may be familiar with our next scale product, but our product is the uh, it's a 6U chassis, the N N1200 enclosure, 6U with 10 10 fans and six power supplies, and within that we can have compute nodes, the top left NX360M5, or we can have a storage node that attaches onto on top of the compute node or we can have a GPU or a PCI expansion tray that attach on top of the compute node, or we can have a 3U 
what you know, three what we call a two U GPU storage node that also attaches on top of the compute nodes. Right? These are half width, half height type um half one U one U blade that fits within the chassis. So within the chassis you can have up to twelve compute nodes. You can have up to six storage expansion nodes. You can have up to six PCI um, next um, nodes that have up to um, up to 12 GPUs, or you can have up to four GPU tray. We're using a two U GPU storage expansion that you can have up to 16 GPUs within that one chassis in a six U uh, rack rack space. All right, the different features of each one of those are listed below, such as we can we were now able to offer the Broadwell processor in the compute nodes using the V4 um, type CPUs and up to 44 cores per node using a 22, um, 22 core CPU for a dual socket node and also up to one terabyte of memory per, per node. So each one of these different offerings, um, based on the fact that we have the storage node, we have the PCI next scale, next 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 node, and we also have the two U GPU node. With that, again, all those fits on top of the GP the compute node, meaning that they they all can have up to 44 cores per node or even one terabyte of memory if we were to have a storage rich or a GPU rich type type node. And again, you can mix any of these. Um, offerings within the same chassis as far as compute, storage, and GPU. The different um, different features of the next scale compute nodes, you have the you have the single PCI by 16 riser. We have the rear drive bay that can house up to one three and a half inch drive or we can have up to two two and a half inch drive in the rear drive bay or or you can have up to four one by eight um, SSD drives right um, with this new offering also you can have the optional for internal hard drive meaning you have two non hot swappable drive in the rear in the rear of the, the server itself, and then you can have two hot swap drives in the front. And by doing so, you would be, be eliminating the use of the PCI by 16 slot that is in the front of the, the server. We also have the option for the by 16 mezzanine card that you can use for Ethernet or InfiniBand type, um, type of adapters. Um, the front of the server, as you can see, shows the um, the two hot swap drives in the front of the server, and also you have the 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 mezzanine card in 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 this in the front slot where you can have a dual port, 10 gig or dual port InfiniBand adapter or or, or any other type of um, Ethernet adapter that you choose to have. Again, the chassis is 12U for 12 half height, half U space. It's a 6U, 6U chassis. And you have choice of six power supplies, 900 watt, 1300 watt, or 1500 watt power supply. Depends on your processor, depends on your memory, and depends on your IO, and it depends on the, the GPU that you decide to install within the chassis, then you can have the choice of power supplies. Um, again, you can have you can have N plus one or N plus N type of power configurations where if you lose the power supply out of the six power supplies, then then the entire chassis will continue to function. Right? You have no built-in networking in the chassis. You have nothing to manage the chassis. The only thing that you have within the back of the chassis is a fan and power controller that. That is used to monitor the power of each node and to control the fan speed of the entire chassis. And you can mix and match again compute, storage, and acceleration. 
right? The, the next scale, two U GPU storage next, next expansion tray offers you up to four GPUs that sits on top of a, a compute node. And the compute node is no different from the, from the compute node that you would put it within the chassis that doesn't have any type of IO or PCI ex expansion attached to it. It's the same compute node. Uh, you can have up to four hot swap uh, hard drives. Um, and everything else basically would, would remain the same. So on the bottom, on the, on the, on the right of your screen, you'll see the different um, GPU cards that are currently supported, such as the um, NVIDIA Tesla K10, K40, and K80 that can go into that, into that um, GPU um, tray. So basically you can have four of these within the single chassis and have up to 16 GPUs in a 6U form factor. So, so we have just been, with the Broadwell that just got released back in March, we are now able to offer the Broadwell SKUs on our, in our next scale product. And we can offer up processors up to 22 two cores per socket within the next scale compute nodes. Uh, we have the, the thermal design profile power, the TDP, that goes up to 145 watts um, type processor. So, so with that, you know, the, you know, depends, you can still max out the, the chassis, the next scale chassis with 12 compute nodes and still be able to cool the chassis if you were to look at the higher processor bins with the higher wattage and still be able to cool with the, um, with the 10 power, 10 fans and six power supplies. So the SKUs that we offered within the next scale chassis are highlighted below. As you can tell, you have the, the ones that are segment optimized, basically the ones that have the higher wattage and, and, and some with, with lower wattage processor SKU. The one we tend to use most, most had regularly is, is, is the advanced um, on your top left where you can see we have like the 2680V4, which is a 14 core, 2.4 gigahertz, or we may look towards the 2695, which is, all, which is an 18 core, 2.1 gigahertz, 120 watts. So for HPC, we tend to try to focus on, on those 120 watt type um, Broadwell SKU simply because of um, price versus um, performance. So the dense, the dense offering that we have is the, um, and this product will be available. It is announced now, so it will be available for ship support um, come July. What we have, we have the SD350, which is a Thing server, not and it's not a System X type um, server, and it it comes in a two U form factor with four compute nodes in it. So there are five non hot swap fans that we can have in this unit, right? These fans, as you can see in the top top right. Uh, the fan bracket, they are 80 millimeter type fans. Um, the choice of power supply for this, um, for the N400, is 1200 watts and 1600 watts. So if we take a closer look, for instance, at the compute node, you'll see that uh, it uses the Broadwell processor. You have dual socket, and you also have 16 dim slots within within the chassis. It has the same form factor as, for instance, the next scale compute nodes where you can have two half width server within a one use space. Some of the features of the of the SD350, S350 by the way, is the compute nodes and the N400 is the chassis that 
four of those S350 can 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 fit in. So, so some of the feature that it offers it includes the by 16 single by 16 PCIe slot and two mezzanine by eight slot that you can either have a network interface card or a by eight um, type HPA such as a fiber channel adapter. It is different from it doesn't use the UEFI that that are the IMM that we have on our um, x86 system X hardware. It uses a different BIOS, which makes it a lot easier to to manage. It still comes with the IPMI interface. It still comes with the BMC interface that you can do your remote power management or your remote management of the nodes, such as power and off, power and off, serial over LAN, and and so on. Right, some of the feature on the front, as you can see, they have a one gigabit management port. Um, that port is actually dedicated and it cannot be shared uh, with the uh, with the onboard Ethernet interface. You have the onboard um, COM standard is is a 10 gig port, a dual 10 gig port that takes up to two SFP plus type of connection. And then on the front of the each server, there are six hot swappable hard drives. So within the chassis you can have, or the 2U chassis, you can have up to 24 two and a half inch um, drives. Each each server will have six hard drives per node. And with that you can have RAID 0, 1, or 10 as, as, as a rated file system. Right. A closer look at the at the chassis or the enclosures, which is the N400, is just a front view. And notice that the labeling of which nodes are assigned the, um, the, the assigned the different hard drives. So basically, node one would have hard drives zero through five. Node two would have six through six through ten, and so on. Right. And also a closer look at the rear of the chassis where you you see each node um are positioned with its own kvm and then you have a dual power hot swappable power supply right the the server itself or the entire enclosure can fit into a um into a standard slash enterprise rack right the width 833, or the depth, 833 millimeter um, fits perfectly within any any standard rack using um, using specialized um, railing kit designed for this for this enclosure. All right, quick look at the different um, system X hardware that we have to offer. Um, we have our 1U X3550 server, and that server is also offered the Broadwell processor, um, 24 DIMM slot, um, 24 megahertz um, DIMMs, and three DIMMs per channel, or two DIMMs per channel when you look at the 2400 megahertz. This is a 1U server. And it, we usually have it packaged in in any solution that we design, basically because it can be used for management or any for any other um, function, such as um, um, file system management, quota, NFS type storage, or even use in, you know a GSS environment as a support node for our mounting file system over SIF or NFS. So I won't get into detail of the features of the 3550, but, but basically, it again, it's just a 1U box um, that has, you can have up to up to 10 2 and a half inch drives or four 3 and a half inch drive within that server. Our next flagship System X product is a 3650. And that server is a 2U form package. It, it is the same identical server as the X3550. 
the difference between the two servers that the 3650 offers more hard drives as compared to the 3550, and it also gives you more I.O. slots, such as more PCIe slots. Um, compared to the 3550. Besides that, every everything the same, uses the same power supplies, um, same fans, and so on. And also I should point out with the 353650, we also offer it up to eight NVMe drives that are now supported uh, with the 3650 2U server. We have also our 2U or a 4U four processor capable X3850. Um, and that server has just been announced with 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 our Broadwell processor um, to be supported. Right? We can have we, the server has up to 96 NIM slots and for a total of six terabytes um, of RAM using 64 gig DIMMs. All right, the different features, as you can tell, are all highlighted. It uses a dual power supply that can either be 900 watt, 1400 watt, or 750 watt. The front of the, of the server, we have what we call compute books. So within the 3850, you can have up to four compute books. So basically, you can design the 3850 starting with one compute book. Each compute book has one processor and 24 DIMM slots. So if you were looking to to start off with a high memory type machine and, and you and your plan is to double the amount of memory or even double the processor in the near future, then you can always start off with one processor and with 24 DIMMs and then you can add another processor with 24 DIMMs up to a total of four processors and 96 gig DIMMs total within the X3850 X6. So, so by design, you do not have to start off with four processor within the X3850. We also have what we call the X3950. And the X3950 is 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 two of the X3850 um, connected together using what we call with a QPI type cabling, right? So basically, you now have eight eight processor in an HU form factor. Again, these are two X3850 connected together using a QPI type link, right? And again, the same. The same approach can be taken, such as starting off with one processor or starting off with four processor, and each has its own DIMMs, 24 DIMMs per processor. So with the 3950, you can have up to a total of 12 terabytes of RAM, 192 DIMM slots. So this leads us to what we call our condo cluster model, right? And with condo cluster, um, basically, basically, uh, if you're 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 having, you already have, or the customer already have their data center laid out. They have a they have a few researchers, you know, for instance, in the educational space, they have a few researchers who have a bucket of money and they would like to to basically buy a few hardware, install it in, in, in a rack or so, and then later on when they acquire more more funding, they can go they can add additional hardware to the same footprint. So basically a condo cluster is something that is basically defined as being elastic. Right, you're you're selling what you have to meet the current need, or buying what you have to meet the current need, and as time progresses, and the compute capacity increases, then then you buy more or we sell more to basically add additional capacity um, based on the um, based on the infrastructure. 
So basically the design or the infrastructure is already set in place and all you're doing is, is adding more compute to that environment, right? So what's defined a condo cluster? Is it right for everyone? It, it's basically not, right? A few points to consider is that um, if you don't have enough money, then you basically will be, you know, you can you can set up the infrastructure provided you have enough funding to, to start with, set up the infra infrastructure, and then after setting up the infrastructure, then you can easily populate and add additional capacity as, as your needs grow, right? So basically, I no longer get large pools of funding all, all, at all times. So, so would you consider that a, to be part of your condo cluster? Absolutely, because what that's going to give you is going to it's going to allow you to buy what you can afford, and then later on, if you get the small funding or additional funding, then you can go off and buy the additional resources that that you would like. Right for and and this works perfectly in, in in the educational space because you you may have a bunch of um, research professors who who get their own dollar, and they would like to uh, to add to what the university already has has to offer. Um, so so these are different um, build outs of what I. A condo cluster would look like, for instance, here's a 24 node chunk, right? So basically, you start off with 24 nodes in a rack. You leave room within the rack to add additional infrastructure, additional compute nodes. So basically, in, in, in phase one, you have 24 nodes, two PDUs, one Ethernet switch, one core IB switch, or even one core IB leaf switch. So, and in phase two, you can add another 24 nodes, and notice what you're eliminating. If you're doing a two-to-one oversubscription in phase two, you basically do not need to purchase another core switch because for those of us who knows HPC, you already have a core switch that has, for instance, 36, um, 36 IB ports on it. So in phase one, the core switch has already been been installed in the rack. So in, in phase two, all, your, all, you, all you would be doing is adding 24 more nodes and one leaf switch. And from the leaf switch in node two, in phase two, that will connect to the core switch that's a, that was already installed in phase one. And the same thing goes for phase three. You had another 24 nodes in phase three, and all you would be doing is adding the node plus PDUs and another, and, and another IB leaf switch, therefore completely filling out that rack or that infrastructure that you have already had in place. All right, so basically that's, that's what a kind of cluster would, would, would look like if you were to design out your data center for something like that. Um, here we have an example using the same example for an Intel Omnipath, right? Um, same 24 node chunks, right? And you would do the same thing in each phase. So it's not just for InfiniBand, it could be for 10 gig, it could be for um, Omnipath, or it could be for any other type of um, networking for that, for that cluster. The, okay, let me go back up one slide. So here's also a 36 node upgrade chunk, right? Based on a three to one block erasure um, using Omnipath, right? Uh, with an Omnipath switch, uh, each one you switch can either be a 48 port switch or a 24 port Omnipath switch. In this example, we're using the um, the 48 port Omnipath switch for a for a um, for a three to one blocking ratio. So so here we have the same infrastructure built out. We have the Ethernet and we have one Omnipath leaf switch um, designed within the um, within the condo cluster. 
And in phase two, we had another 36 core um, nodes and another Omnipath switch. And then the second Omnipath switch will basically connect into the first Omnipath leaf switch, making it a, a two-tier type, type um, fat tree topology. Right? Uh, with condo cluster, right, if you have the infrastructure built out, and this is just one example that we have used at a different university. So basically, um, the university had its own um, condo type um, environment configured. It has all, the university has all the infrastructure in place. It has an X scale chassis. It has, the, it has the switches, it has the cabling, it has the racks, it has the power, it has the cooling, everything already shipped and installed in a data center at the university. And when we hear what we have done in Lenovo, we have basically gone out and designed a site specifically, as you can see, Northwestern University. We specifically designed a web portal for Northwestern University where Whenever Northwestern University decides to, you know, to acquire or purchase an additional compute, um, they can go to the website, order the compute nodes, and the compute nodes will ship directly to them. And all they would have to do is to basically unpackage um, the compute nodes and basically just plug it in into the existing next scale chassis, empty next scale chassis that they have as part of the, um, the infrastructure. So again, uh, we can design different web portals for different customers based on how, how often they purchase um, from Lenovo and the type of equipment that they would want us to, to you know, to offer on the, on the web portal for them to easily just access, click, and, 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 um, and, and place an order, right? So, so this is something that is, actually up and running today, and Northwestern is actually utilizing it to, um, to, to, to continue um, building out their, um, their condo or empty racks with infrastructure built in from Lenovo. Got a couple of questions for you, Lerone. Okay. Uh, the, first one, the first one is, is there a sizing and configuration tool available? We, we have been using what we call the, um, the XConfig tool to design our, our HPC solutions. And with the XConfig tool, it, it's, 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 it's available on the internet, it's open, it's not just restricted to the internal Lenovo folks, right? Anyone can download and install it and use it to configure any, any cluster, including condo clusters, right? The, 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 the cool thing about OX config tool is that it just doesn't give you configuration and just give you loose parts uh, without displaying how it should be laid out in a rack. The tool actually gives you, gives you the rack layout. You can position every single item within the rack. You can position the PDUs within the rack, the switches within the rack. As far as and and then you you also decide which use space you would like for these different components to be installed in, right? You have the choice of selecting whether the cabling is going to be overhead or it's going to be under the floor. Um, and also, once you have that solution design, which is what I'm calling it, it will generate all your peer-to-peer -peer cabling, meaning that. From each node within the rack to the top of rack switch, which port the node will plug into, and also it'll generate the form of labeling, right? So, so we have that tool that we use to design our HPC solution, and that tool is not just for HPC. It does other things such as um, um, our big data offer, and you can access it and 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 can act and can um, actually edit some of our big data um, architecture that we have in there, plus plus other things. That, that I'm hoping that answered the question, but we do have um, different configuration tools that we can use to design these different solutions. I I posted a link on the chat session for 
all of the configuration tools that are out there on our okay. website. The other question was, uh, what are the requirements to get to the portal setup for customers? The the um, if you're look if you're talking about the web the web store that that uh, that I have up displaying, that is something we would have to talk about, right? Because based on the way, for instance, the way Northwestern University buys from Lenovo, this is something that they actually requested, and. Um, Mark Fisher and I, my, my counterpart, we actually take it back to Lenovo and they were able to design a site that looks like what you're seeing on the screen so that each customer, so that Northwestern can actually go in, place the order, and have the, um, the server shipped to them. Again, they, they have the infrastructure in place, meaning that they, you know, they have the next scale chassis, empty next scale chassis installed in the rack. They have the switches. They have all the cabling. Basically, we, we were able to design the solution so that all the cabling come um, installed in the rack and labeled. So when, whenever Northwestern is ready to go out and make an additional purchase based on the needs of their, their different users, they just have to order the compute nodes, right? And that node gets shipped and they just have to install it in one of the empty next scale um, um, chassis bay. Right, so that's something, that's a conversation that, that we can have um, offline if, if you have customers who would like to, you know, take advantage or even start looking at doing something like this, that's, not, that's a conversation we, we, we can have. I don't know if we'll be able to do it for all customers, but this is just, you know, a, a starting point as to what we can do. Any other questions, or did I answer it? Open, I did. Well, they haven't they haven't posted anything back up on the the chat session, so I assume we're good. Okay. Well, he said yes. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? Nope. That was it. Okay. So. I just have a few more slides to, to, to touch on, and, and this is just going to be a brief overview of our, our GSS offering. Right? This is something that we all, most of us are familiar with, and, and GSS, as you, you know, stand for GPFS Storage Server, it was something that we brought over from IBM as part of the transition. IBM still owns the GPFS code as part of this offering. So all we all the Nova is responsible for us is OEM and the, the the GPFS software from IBM itself. The hardware is provided by by Lenovo, the JBOD, the, the the X86 servers that is used within the GSS. So basically GSS is is is, is an is a storage appliance, right? It's a storage appliance because it offers it offers GPFS in the form of what we call small building blocks. So we have we have offerings that we refer to as different um, GSS models, such as such as GSS 24, GSS 22, GSS 26. Right within each GSS, we have what we call the different JBODs. Each JBOD can have up to 60 hard drives or can have up to 24 hard drives, depends on the GSS model that, that you choose. So, so in this case, to easily understand what a, what a GSS is, the GSS has um, what we call, for, what we, for instance, we have the GSS 22. What that means is that we have two x86 servers and two JBODs. We have the GSS 26. What that means is that we have two x86 servers and six JBODs. And the same thing for the GSS 24. We have two x86 servers and four JBODs. So the GSS basically um, takes the takes the hardware RAID 
out of the controller and have it housed on on those two x86 servers that is part of the GSS. And that's why we are only using the JBOD in a GSS offering. So traditionally, you when you buy a disk a disk array or a disk controller, the disk the disk array comes with dual or single disk controller. That controller actually controls all the RAID array or allows you to configure the RAID array with your different um, um, segment size and so on. In a GSS, the hardware RAID is, is no longer um, important. So basically the, the RAID is now within the software. So this becomes a software RAID type approach. So basically you're taking all the bottlenecks from off of the the RAID controller, the hardware RAID controller, I'm putting that into into software. The question got a question for yes. you. Um, who owns the who owns the support for the GSS solution, Lenovo or IBM? Lenovo owns the support, right? Lenovo owns the support, right? If if we Lenovo cannot solve the problem, then we go to IBM to get the support, right? But everything, you know, because you're purchasing and acquiring the 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 GSS from Lenovo, Lenovo owns it, right? If a critic was to be open, it would be open with Lenovo. That's just an example. And then we will get the right folks involved. Okay. Right. So, so again, okay. so again, the, the GSS or the GNR, GPFS native RAID, that is the actual software that is used to create your RAID array. And within a GSS environment, we usually do an 8 plus 2P type RAID array. Again, that is all done within, within software. So, with GNR or GPFS native RAID, that is the actually, that is the secret sauce to a GSS solution, right? So the GFS, so the GPFS uh, native RAID has something we call a declustered type of RAID. Basically what that means is that all the RAID array, in a RAID file system, all the zeros and ones and the fault tolerance is written across all the disks within the, the array. So so with the with the with the GNR code and a deep clustered array, the way that works is that if you have an eight plus two P rate array, mean that means that all your parity gets written across all ten disks in that array. If you were to have another eight plus two P type array, again all the different Parity gets written across those 10 disks in that 8 plus 2P array. What that means is that if you have a disk failure, the rebuild time to, once you replace the disk, the rebuild time is, is, is less than, it's almost unnoticeable, right? Because it would be so, so little that the rebuild time would, would be much faster than compared to a traditional hardware, hardware RAID array, right? So, so again, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we sell so much of the, 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 the GPFS GSS because of the declustered array and, 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 the, and, the, and the speed and parts and also the rebuild time as far as if you have a failed disk. Um, so I won't get into further detail of, of what we offered with that, but just to give you an example of what the performance of a GSS 26 would look like, right? Notice that we have a streaming rate. The write that we can get in a GSS 26 is 20 gigabytes per second and a read up to 30 gigabytes per second. And this is using three FDR connections per node, right? Three FDR connections per node. So within a single building block of a GSS 26, again, we have two servers and six JBODs, right? So you, we have a total of 348 um, 
near line fast drives, and then we um, use an eight terabyte capacity um, disk drives. Um, the raw data within a GSS 26 is almost 2.5 petabytes, or petabytes. <laughs> and then you have the usable capacities like 2.1 petabytes, right? Again, just take note of the performance when you, if you were to compare that against any other storage offering, uh, with six J bots, two, two, two GPFS servers, right? You can have 20 gigabytes um, streaming writes or 30 gigabytes streaming reads. This is this is this this is a lot faster compared to to any other offerings that that we have or that you see, um, like compared to, say, for instance, DDN. The, another thing to look at is how we compare the GSS-24, how that compares to the GSS-26, right? It almost, almost two-third, the, the GSS-24 is almost two-third the performance of the GSS-26. As, as you can see on the, on, on the left of the screen, we have, in the GSS-24, we have two servers and four, four JBODs, right? Um, and again, this is also using the eight terabyte nearline SAS drives, right? The GSS is sold as an appliance, right? It comes with the GPFS code, the latest version of the GPFS code, that depends, which depends on the release of the GSS. And it it also have come you know the, the operating system is Red Hat that that's what it's been tested on um, Red Hat with the GPFS the so this last slide just basically show you the different offerings for the GSS multiple offerings, multiple flavors, and a different drive size. So depends on the capacity of the say for the raw storage or usable storage, we can configure each GSS using three terabyte, four terabyte, six terabyte, or eight terabyte drives. Right? If there's a need to have um, SSDs or SAS SSDs, then we can configure a GSS 26, GSS-22, GSS-24, S. Notice the S on the name of the GSS on, on the right of your screen. That tells you if it's if it's um, SSD um, type form of GSS. So we so so we would use the SSD GSS versions for say um, burst buffer in our fast access to I/O stuff like that. And then the regular GSS is just for regular um, high capacity, high, high bandwidth type um, type storage. Um, I think that's that's it. Question, it's, um, question yeah, about the presentation. Yes. Uh, is Red Hat supplied as part of the appliance, or is that a separate license and support purchase? It is part of the, it, it is each each software that is configured with the GSS, there, there's a premium for it. So it's not, it's not bundled in the GSS and you get one price, right? For instance, if the customer has a site license, then we can eliminate the Red Hat um, license, right? They just have to have when they install the GSS, they would have to install the version of Red Hat that is supported, right? The GPFS software, if they have a site license for GPFS, that can also be be eliminated from the code. The only thing that cannot be eliminated from the code would be the GNR code, the GPFS native RAID, which is the secret sauce for you to do your, your GSS um, deployment. Right. So, so again, it's just, yes, 
they would have to have Red Hat. So if they were to call IBM or call Lenovo for support, if we were to escalate it to IBM, then it would, you know, they would require to have Red Hat. He says thank you. Yeah, I have um, this. This is the end of the um, the presentation. If there's any other questions, I'll go ahead and and answer them. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat window. Not seeing any questions come in. Okay. Well, thank you, Lerone. Um, I appreciate you coming on and uh, presenting this to us today. And, okay. Uh, and Kevin, you you have the slides, so um, feel free to yes, distribute they, them. There's nothing in there that is that is confidential. Um, those have already been posted to the uh, the user group site. And okay. the video replay of this, once it gets finished, I will post that out there also. Okay. All right. So, so thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Lerone. And with that, I will end the meeting.